pork for them. Now, I very much believe in caging your tomatoes, and there are two or three different kinds of cages, but uh, somebody did some research one time, and they actually measured the number of pounds of fruit that they picked off of a tomato plant. And tomato plants were just allowed to kind of grow and sprawl out on the ground. They got about 10 pounds of fruit off a healthy plant. Then they compared that with tomatoes that were staked, where people put a stake in and tied them up to the stake, which is, you know, the old-fashioned way of doing it. A lot of folks still do it. They averaged about 20 pounds of fruit per plant on a healthy plant. And then we went to cages, and with cages we double that again. And a good healthy plant grown properly, you should expect to get about 40 pounds of fruit per plant. At $1.99 or whatever I saw them for in the grocery store the other day, one of the few things that really becomes, you know, economically viable is growing tomatoes. So many people, the way they garden, you know, they spend $40 to produce a pound of produce they could have bought for $2.99. But tomatoes, if you do it right, you can really do it very, very well. So plan on caging your tomatoes, regardless of the size. If you're growing determinants, it doesn't have to be a real big cage. If you're growing indeterminates, eight feet. You know, the bigger the cage, the better. Now, you can do a lot of things. The first tomato cages I ever had, I just went to a hardware store, bought fence wire, you know, made them into circles about this big around. Well, actually, probably about this big around. I didn't know how big they grew at the time, and I used those. And whatever kind of cage you use, do take a piece of rebar or pipe or something and stick down in the edge of the cage because that wire cage may not blow over in the wind, but once it gets full of tomato plant and you've got that sail there, man, I've seen big tomato plants just fall over and crash because the cages weren't properly supported. So put something in to support them. The best tomato cage in the business, in my opinion, is made by the Texas Tomato Cage Company. <laughs> what is wrong with these cages? They're expensive. I bought five cages per year for about 10 years, and now I've got enough cages. So, um, you know, if you've got friends and you want to give an appreciated gift to a gardener or something like that, pay $26.50 or something wow. like that. The beauty of these things is when they're not in use, you can go hang them on the wall or on the fence as I do. When they are in use, they grow like that. You just push those things down in the ground. I'll go ahead and stick a piece of rebar down on the edge to hold them up. But if you want a really good quality tomato cage, I think these are the best things to do. But again, I've, if you've recently won the lottery and want to go out and buy 50 of these things, I'd like to sell you the plants to go in them. But anyway, if you just, it's amazing. You know, I thought five a year, I'll never get enough, and all of a sudden I had all the tomato cages I could use. The other thing that is nice about this particular, or any kind of tomato cage, but uh, I actually probably am not going to use all my cages on tomatoes this year. This is a great thing to grow cucumbers on. It's a great thing to grow beans on. It's a great thing to grow snow peas on. And if this isn't big enough, if you truly need an eight-foot cage, as you will if when you really learn to grow these things well, they actually have little extensions you can put on the top of these things. So uh, cage your tomatoes. And you'll do much, much better with them. Now, a few secrets about planting tomatoes. <coughs> Tomatoes are the one plant, or one out of three or four plants, that you can plant deeper than it's originally growing. You hear me harping all the time about root flares on plants, not to ever cover up the root flare on a tomato. You can plant this as deeply as you want to plant it. Don't hesitate. I mean, if you like digging in a big hole, and you're able to, you can plant your tomatoes as big as you want. Years ago, when I worked with Alton Grimm up in the hill country, excuse me, we had a fellow come in toward the end of the season every year, and he always wanted to buy all of our overgrown tomato plants. And I said, how on earth are you going to plant these things? Because these things were like this long. And he said, well, I do it one of two ways. He said, I either dig a hole as deep as I can, then I let these things get really dry to where the plants get limp, and I literally curl them up inside of the hole, put the soil in and water it, and that, that goes well. He said, the other thing I'll do if they're really overgrown is dig a little trench and lay them down sideways and just bend the top up out of the soil. If you want to see a tomato plant grow vigorously and produce well, imagine this plant with roots all the way up, you know, six inches of the stem. So tomatoes are one plant that you can plant deeper, and it won't hurt anything. Now, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, I think that if you really want to grow good 
tomatoes, good peppers, good eggplants. When do you start? You start in about November, December, maybe January at the earliest. And I've had a lot of people that have adopted this technique that I use and been very, very successful at it. When it's the middle of the winter and I'm looking for something to do in the garden, because we've got a nice sunny day and I can't stay inside if it's a nice sunny day, I'll go out and get ready for planting my plants like this very, very early in the season. And the way that I get ready is I'll go out and everywhere that I'm going to put tomato, pepper, eggplant, any of these things that are individual plants, I'll put uh, three or four things down. I'll start with a good fertilizer. The fertilizer that I use the most of in my own garden is this Medina Granular Organic, only of course, you know, 40 pound bags, a lot more economical. But you can use just about any kind of fertilizer you like. I personally do not like biosolids fertilizers in the sewage sludge fertilizers in the garden. Some people use it, some people think it's fine. But I'm not going to use the huactinite or the milorganite or the garden bill product that is based on the, uh, on the sludge product. This is a poultry litter based compost and this is what I use a lot of in my garden. And it hadn't affected me yet, I don't think. But if you, if you want to stay, if you want to go with something that is absolutely non-manure based, then you can go with an alfalfa based fertilizer. Meister Grow makes this one they call Garden Glow, or if you want to buy a big bag, you can buy what they call their Texas Tea Lawn Fertilizer. Tomatoes really aren't particular. Any good organic fertilizer is going to do the job. But I'll start with my fertilizer, and I'll put one to two cups of it just on top of the ground. Then I think another very important thing is Epsom salts. Does anybody know what blossom end rot is? Your tomato starts to grow and the bottom end starts to get watery and discolored looking and then eventually turns sunken and black. And You can cut the top half of the tomato off and eat it, but it never seems to taste quite as good when you know what the bottom half looked like. Not a disease in any way, form, or fashion. They call it blossom end rot, but it is not a disease. That is what results when you've got a, an imbalance of calcium and magnesium in the soil. Don't worry about that. Let's just talk about how you get rid of it. If your plants are already planted and growing, you go to the grocery store and you get some Epsom salts. The bag I bought last week was about so big, cost $2.03, I think. Pretty cheap insurance. But I just prevent it, because I used to have blossom in rot on some of the tomatoes, and then I'd go back and, you know, treat it, and the ones that had it I lost, but the new ones didn't. Nowadays, I just go down the row when I'm going to be planting, and I just put a handful, probably the equivalent of a tablespoon or two of Epsom salts, down on top of that pile of fertilizer that I put on top of the ground. I've not had one incident of blossom end rot since I started doing that. So Epsom salts are cheap and it's just it's blossom end rot insurance. You'll not have blossom end rot if you use a little bit of Epsom salts. Bob. Yes. Uh, yes. Can you put the fertilizer and the Epsom salts in the bottom of the hole as you're digging it to set the plants in? You can, but let me tell you why what I'm telling you is going to be better. This late, you may have to do that, but this is for next year when you get ready to plant your tomato plants. And I'll just, this is just a technique I use. I'll put this on top of the ground. If I think I'm at all deficient in iron or anything like that, I'll put a handful of either the Medina Micronutrients or this new product we're uh, experimenting with called Actino Iron and just put a handful of that down. And the thing that makes for sweetness in vegetables is potassium. And you can buy fancy potassium fertilizers or you can use wood ashes. I use wood ashes because I have wood burning stoves. And good old wood ashes, just again, just a good handful, you're going to make absolutely certain that you've got all the potassium you need. That's why the common name of it is potash, because the original potassium source was ash from the fire pot or whatever. So I just will put a little bit of, uh, of wood ashes down. And remember, I started in a garden with extremely hard soil, worn out soil that somebody probably been gardening in that spot for about 80 years. So I've got this little pile of all these things on top of the ground, and then I will um, take compost, and uh, I guess you didn't get a bag of it out here, but I use the ladybug compost. I think 